while you're still standing, let me read Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. And I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Turn to the person next to you and say, neighbor, tears that transform. Amen. You may be saying, tears that transform. I will tell you, the series that Katani and Felix just did was an amazing series. Amen? <laughs> there were times when I left the series and I was like, oh, wow, ooh, whoo, went home sore, right? Um, and then Felix and I would get together during the week and we'd both cry, right? <laughs> because <laughs> God was working on us. How many of you have ever been in church and you felt that? The word of God goes forth in a sermon, in a teaching, or a prayer, or even a song, and God just like, oof, right? And tears flow down your eyes, and, 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 and you know that, that something has grabbed you. You know that something has, has resonated with you. But a lot of times, that's where it stops. A lot of times, it just stops at that initial emotional reaction. And I want to tell us today that God is challenging us to have tears that transform us. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, these tears ought to transform me. You can't come out of a series like Naked and Unashamed and hear all of these great gems about relationships, and hear all of these great gems about marriage, and hear all of these great gems about being aligned with God and stay the same. Turn to somebody and say, guess what? You can't stay the same. Part of our frustration with ourselves is we stay the same. We go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you need to stop eating donuts. We ignore the doctor. We go to Lamar's. And, and we then get mad when we're out of breath playing with kindergartners at Hoop Scoop. Amen. We, 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 we have emotional responses to things. But we get no transformation because all we've been is emotional. Turn to your neighbor, say neighbor. Move beyond emotion. Two years ago, we were, we were talking in, in our country about Philando Castro and we were talking about police killings and we were talking about police being shot in Dallas and everybody was hands up, don't shoot and everybody was doing all of these emotional things and, 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 and we're still we're still, we're still talking about violence and people being killed and, and police officers doing this and, and people doing that. We're still talking about these same things because, brothers and sisters, we are stuck in a cycle of just emotional responses. We're not transforming. We'll cry about it. We'll get mad about it. We'll raise our voices about it. We'll Facebook about it. But we're not transforming. Everybody say transform. See, when you look at, when you look at this, let me, let me give you some background first. Let me give you some background on this text before we jump in. Because I'm a history nerd. A, 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 ba a bit of background on this text. Disobedience had caused the children of Israel to be where they are. Let me say that again. Disobedience had caused, this, caused the children of Israel to be where they are. I say the same thing to us today. That disobedience has caused us to be where we are. 
Y'all remember when Felix did that? Uh, did that? He said, "Look, here is here is sin. Here, here's the garden. Here's the perfect situation, and here's where we are in sin. Right? We we are, we are operating from this paradigm." And because we are operating from this paradigm, there are things that we are dealing with today simply because we are disobedient. Remember what he said? The children of Israel were where they were, had been decimated by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persians because of disobedience. See, God was faithful. God was faithful to his covenant promises, but the children of Israel, Israel and Judah, they were disobedient, and so they found themselves in disarray because they had convinced themselves that we can do it our own way and not God's way. I want to submit that there are some things going on in our lives, in our communities, in our country, because we choose to cry about things, but we keep walking in disobedience. We, 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 we go to the doctor and the doctor tells you your cholesterol's up or your, your, your blood pressure's up or, or you're obese, you're overweight, and, and you continue to eat the way you eat, you continue not to work out, you continue to do all these things thinking that you are magically going to develop a six pack. That through osmosis, you can take the exercise tape and put it on top of your head, and it's going to go. It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. You wish it did. You wish that you could still have your cake and eat it too, right? With some ice cream on top. Some vanilla bean or some moose tracks. Yeah, see, I know that's, yeah. The children of Israel were where they were because of disobedience. The returned exiles had come and they had rebuilt the temple, right? Under Zerubbabel and Ezra, they had come and they had rebuilt the temple. But the problem was the wall was still down. And with the wall still being down, it meant that they were still vulnerable to attack. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, still vulnerable to attack. See, look, 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 you can come to church, to the temple, and, and you can praise God and, and, and do your thing and cry here, but if you go back and you keep living in this paradigm, what you are doing is, is coming to the temple, but your wall is still down. You are still vulnerable to attack because there's been no transformation in your situation. Yes, the temple was up. Yes, Ezra had rebuilt it. But they were still vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy because they were still living in disobedience. And we remain vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy because we keep living in disobedience. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I don't want to be attacked. I don't want to be attacked, right? So, so, so we look at this. We look at this text, and it says, Nehemiah, if you go to ne Nehemiah, in that first, that first chapter there, Nehemiah has some buddies, his brother and some friends come back from visiting. And, and look at the text. In the words of Nehemiah, the son, now it happened in the month of Chislov in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Let me tell you what we have to do first. We have to hear the truth. Come on, turn to somebody next day. We got to hear the truth. What makes all of this sermon work is that you have to open yourself to the reality that there are some truths that we have to hear. My buddy Nehemiah was in a very comfortable place in his life. Nehemiah was, was the cupbearer of the king, and we're going to get there later, but he was the cupbearer of the king in a very comfortable spot, and, and Nehemiah had to hear some truths that he did not want to hear. He said the situation back at home is still 
as bad as it's always been. And, and it wasn't that the wall had just fallen down. This thing had been down for some time. Okay? Catch that in your life. There are some things in your life that did not just happen. They have been happening. There are some hurts and heartaches in your life that did not just happen yesterday, but they've been going on year after year after year after year after year. And because you choose to walk in disobedience, it just continues. And so here Nehemiah was. He, he, he heard from his brother and he heard from the man who had come back from Judah. And Nehemiah's response was like all of our responses are when we hear bad news. He had an emotional response. He had an emotional response, and, 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 and as he heard it, he, it says he wept and he cried, and, and, and he had all of this emotional response. But Nehemiah did not stay stuck in his emotions, okay? Let's look at this next slide. Can go to the next slide for me, please? Go to the next one. Okay, so, so, so our, big, our, our big idea today, okay, that we need to understand is this, is that our tears should transform us, right? Our tears uh, should cut, should, our tears over continued and current happenings in our lives and communities must move us to seek God and act collaboratively and courageously with him to bring about transformation in the temporal and the eternal. My tears should move me to courageously collaborate with God to bring about transformation in the temporal and the eternal. Say that with me. Say, my tears should cause me to courageously collaborate with God to bring about transformation in the temporal and the eternal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay to cry. Please teach your sons that. It's okay to cry. It's okay to, to have an emotional response. It's okay to be angry. It's okay. But we've got to move from that emotion and courageously collaborate with God to change some things in the temporal and the eternal. It's not enough just to cry about it. It's not enough just to protest about it. It's not enough just to post about it. We've got to be able to say, God, let me join you and do something about it. We make a lot of emotional noise in the church. But there's no doing outside the church. Amen. We do a lot of emotional emoting in our homes, but there's not a lot of doing. God wants to take our tears today. And he wants those tears to be the catalyst for why we courageously collaborate with him to shift things in the temporal and the eternal. Next slide. Look, 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 at, look at what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah says, our tears must first move us to acknowledge pain and emotions. The first thing you've got to understand is say, I'm mad about it. Just try it. You know what you're mad about. Say, I'm mad about it. Right? I could go through a list of things that are going on in our country, things that are going on in our community, things that are going on in your family. I'm telling you, naked and unashamed gave me a list of things that I'm not happy about with me. Right? And, and I said, I can sit here and be unhappy about those things, or I can do something about them. There is no point to continue to look in the mirror and not like what you see and not do something about it. There's no point to be in a marriage that you are not happy about and not do something about it. And I'm not talking about divorce. I'm talking about you getting better at you. See, we've got to first acknowledge the pain and the emotion. Those are important things. I'm hurt. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. 
I, I, I feel down about this. I'm, I'm depressed. All of those, all I tell my kids all the time, the emotions are from God. He gave them to us. He wired them in us. They are triggers that point us in, in so many different directions. But the trouble about emotions, if they are not under the lordship of Jesus Christ, those emotions can get us in trouble. If I'm just acting emotionally in my flesh, I can get in trouble. I've got to acknowledge the pain. I've got to acknowledge the emotions, okay? Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, the pain is real. Your emotions are from God. Okay, the pain is real. My emotions are from God. Acknowledge that, okay? Acknowledge that. It's okay. Don't dismiss people who are hurt about things that you might not be hurt about. Don't dismiss folks who, who are not frustrated about things that you're not frustrated about. Acknowledge their emotions. Acknowledge their pain. But guess what? Don't stay stuck there. This is what happens, okay? This is how you stay in what I call the hamster wheel, okay? Y'all know the, the hamster. Anybody ever had a hamster or a gerbil, right? That gerbil or that hamster gets in that wheel, and what do they just do? running and running and, and, and burning all of this energy and if I was in there, I'd be sweating up a storm and ain't going nowhere. That's what happens when we stay stuck in our pain and our emotions. We get on this hamster wheel and all of this energy is being emoted. All of this energy is just, just, just being, just coming out. And we aren't getting anywhere. And we find ourselves right back at where we have always been. Because we just stay stuck in the emotions and we stay stuck in the pain. The great thing, and this, this is just, in this, this fourth verse of Nehemiah, we learn how to get off the hamster wheel. Turn to the person next to you say, hey. Get off the hamster wheel. Yeah. I, I like to tell people the reason I don't go to the gym that often is because the treadmills are boring. Maybe if they had, like, scenery where you could, like, feel like you're going somewhere, right? That's not the truth. But the reason why, it, that's what life feels like when you're just stuck in your emotions and your pain. You're on a treadmill. You're not going anywhere. You're not making any progress. You sure are tired, though. You sure are sweating, though. You sure feel more, you sure feel worn out, right? But you ain't going anywhere. Next slide. He, he says to us, look, not only, must, not only must you acknowledge the pain, but he says, our tears must move us to align with God in prayer and fasting. Here we go. I'm emotional. I'm in pain. What I must do with that is take that emotion and take that pain and align it with God. Say, align it with God. See, I, I remember in the Parkland shooting that just happened, and everybody gets on TV, and, and, and they start doing this, this hashtag of, we need more than prayer. We need more than prayer. You had some religious folks getting up there saying, we need more than prayer. And I said to myself, I said, y'all must not understand what prayer is. <laughs> if you need more than prayer, I want to know what that is. Okay? Because, see, we need prayer, we need fasting, because those disciplines take my flesh, my emotional reactions, and they bring them to the feet of God and say, God, help me understand what you want me to do with this emotion, with this pain. And without prayer, without fasting, we act without God's guidance. Y'all start acting out movies that you saw. It's a thin line between love and hate. Brothers' clothes get thrown out of windows and cars get keyed and set on fire. Now, that ain't emotion and pain aligned with God. Hear what I'm saying? We've got to take our pain. We've got to take our emotion. 
and we've got to align it with God. That's what Nehemiah was doing. Nehemiah was, look, he was devastated by the condition that his people were still in. He was devastated that they were still on this hamster wheel of disobedience. He was devastated by the fact that, yes, the temple had been rebuilt, but they were still vulnerable to attack because the wall was still down. And Nehemiah said, I know I'm emotional about this. I know I have pain about this. So God, let me bring it to you so that my next steps will be steps that are governed by you and not my emotions. Your emotions will get you in trouble if you have not allowed God to order your steps. Y'all know how blessed you've been. Some of y'all work in corporate America and, and you started to type that emotional email response. Or you might have started to young folks text that emotional response and praise God for somebody next to you saying, wait, 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 <laughs> before you send that, right? Some of the best things that ever happened in my life happened with the delete button. Amen. Or the erase button, right? Because, yes, in the moment I was mad, in the moment I had pain, and I wanted to bless somebody out. But I had to take that emotion. I had to take that pain and say, God, here I am. I'm upset. I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. And I don't know what to do. There's the kicker. We have to admit that we don't know what to do. God, I'm mad about this. I'm hurt about this. This seems bigger than me. God, what do I do? So you take this to God, and you do this through prayer and fasting. The Bible says there's only there's certain things that only come through prayer and fasting. And you sitting there saying, I ain't never prayed, and I ain't never fasted. Well, that's why you ain't got those things that only come through prayer and fasting. Those are Christian discipline. Those are things that we should be doing. That should be the natural habit of our life is that when I'm dealing with difficulties in my life that I cannot handle, that I cannot figure out, my default is to say, God, y'all know what the songwriter said, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we will not. Not we cannot, we will not carry everything to God in prayer. Turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor, you're emotional, you got pain, you need to align that with God through prayer and fasting. So Nehemiah here was dealing with this heartache. You go to the next slide. Nehemiah was here dealing with this heartache, dealing with the situation that his people were in, and Nehemiah said, this is too big a job for me. When I consider the things that are going on in my life, when I consider that I am a husband, and on Wednesday, I will celebrate my 20th wedding anniversary with my wife. <laughs> Excited about that. She the luckiest lady on the planet. I won't say it at 11 o'clock, because she'll be here. Um, <laughs> she, she, she will be celebrating 20 years. We have five kids, right? Right? And I consider all this stuff that we're dealing with, and I sometimes say, God, I can't handle this. And he says back to me, I know. You going to come talk to me about it? And I say, yeah, after I do, and after I do, and after I do, and after I do. And all of my after I do's take me further and further away from talking to him about the situation that I'm so stressed about that I'm so in pain about, that I'm so emotional about. And so, because I won't align with him on it, I stay on the hamster wheel about it. Second thing, second thing he says to us, he says, our, 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 our tears must move us to appreciate, I love this, God positioning. Okay? Our tears must move us to appreciate God positioning, Right? I am where I am, and from where I am, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that I could ever ask, think, or imagine. 
Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I'm in the right space. See, the enemy wants you to think that you are not where you are. You're not in the space that you need to be to change the things that need to be changed. He's a lie. As you read the text, as you finish through chapter 1, Nehemiah says this prayer, and he's talking to God, and at the end of the text, he says, and I was the cupbearer to the king. What did you say? You were the cupbearer to the king. Do you understand the trust that is placed in the cupbearer of the king? Do you understand the confidence? Do you understand the relationship that, that, that the cupbearer has with the king? The king is alive because the cupbearer does his job. And so the king is grateful to the cupbearer for doing his job because he then has life. So God has said to Nehemiah, look, I've already placed you where you need to be to get done what needs to get done. Amen. All of y'all looking for grass greener, and God says you're already where you need to be to do what I need you to do to get done what I need to have done because God has positioned you. See, Nehemiah... And if you go deeper in the text and you find out who the king's stepmom was, right? Y'all know some lady named Esther, right? And you find out all of these alignments and how God has orchestrated this. And you find out that even in our messiness, this is what I love about God. Even in my messiness, God is still causing all things to work together for my good. Even when I can't see it, even when I'm not paying attention, God says, this Negro ain't going to get it right. He going to mess this up. Let me go on over here and, and do this because you know Vernon. He over there. I'm, I'm going to get to you, God. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get to you. And God's like, I can't wait on him. And, and then all of a sudden you walk into something and everything's lined up. And you, Some of y'all may never been there. Maybe that's 11 o'clock, right? You walk into something and you know that when you, last week when you was talking about covered by grace, boy, 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 right? And you know you've been way over here the whole time. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. And then when you finally wake up from crying, oh, God, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? And you open up your eyes and God says, I didn't need you. I already did it. He said, Nehemiah, open up your eyes. Nehemiah, know where you're at. Nehemiah, know the connection that I've already made for you. Nehemiah, know that I have positioned you for such a time as this to do what needs to be done. Nehemiah, I've got you. And God says the same thing to you and I right now. He says, you're thinking, well, when I get here, when I do that, when I get this relationship, when I make this amount of money, when, when I, whatever, whatever, all this positioning, and God says, from right where you are at, I've positioned you. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God has positioned me for such a time as this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, shout about that. Amen. Thank God about that. When you think about the things that you are upset about, the things that you are frustrated about in your life, in, let me, I'm going to show you something funny. I said, the other day, I was looking at my wallet, and you know, I've been talking about this health journey I'm on and trying to eat healthy, and I, this thing fell out of my wallet. You can't see it that close, but I'll tell you what it is. This thing fell out of my wallet the other day, talking about God positioning, and it is an old Planet Fitness It's an old Planet Fitness membership, right? So I was like, oh. And I'm driving down, <laughs> driving down the airport, and I look over, and I see there's a brand new <laughs> Planet Fitness. And so I called Planet Fitness and I said, hey, I want to 
to check on this membership, and they said, oh, yeah, 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 it's still in good standing. <laughs> I said, okay, I, I see you, God. You positioned me to deal with what I need to deal with. So right in there, I just started praising God and thanking him that, that he was working things out. When I was like, yeah, yeah, God, I'm going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, Mom, I'm going to eat healthier. Yeah, yeah, Mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. God will cause things to fall out of your wallet. <laughs> I said, I ain't seen that thing in years. Amen. <laughs> God will cause things to fall out of your wallet to remind you that he has positioned you. That God has connected you with people in the right places to be able to get the right things done for the glory of God. Okay, turn to your neighbor again. Say, neighbor, I accept that God has positioned me for such a time as this to get the right things done. Okay, next, next, next slide. We must, our tears must remind us to act collaboratively and courageously with God, right? I, I, I want to look, look at chapter 2 for me. This, this, is a, this is an inter interesting piece here that I love that, that, that is just about being courageous, about collaborating and being courageous, okay? Here is Nehemiah. Now, let me tell you. Ne Nehemiah, let me read the text. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of the king, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. Now, some people might just skip over that and think that that sentence is not a big deal. But it is. Because you never went in front of a king with your head down and moping. Because the king took it personal. If the king saw your continence down, the king would think that you are making a statement about his reign, and such a statement would cost you your life. And so Nehemiah leaves, leaves this in the text, writes it in his journal, and says, I had never in the 20th year of his reign, in the 20 years that he had been there, I had never been before him with my continence down. But something gave him the courage to show his true colors. God is saying to you that I am going to need you to have the courage to walk into spaces that you've never walked in before. I'm going to need you to have the courage to go to places that you've never been before and be who you are no matter the consequences. Hear it again. He is calling you for such a time as this to go into spaces and places and be who he needs you to be no matter the consequences. Oh, I can't talk about Jesus. They might let me go. He says, I need you to walk in that space. And I need you to talk about Jesus. I, I, I need you. They might not invite me to the barbecue. They, they, they might not invite me to the, to, the, to the let out party. They might not whatever, 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 right? He says, I need you to walk into that space collaborating with me with courage and know that I have you. Look at, it, look what it says in the text. The king says to him, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And it says, Nehemiah says, I was very afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lives in ruins and its gates have been destroyed? And then the king said to me, I love this, what are you requesting? See, there are some things that are not happening in our lives because we won't walk in collaboration and encourage with God. We are so afraid of what this Persian king and whatever, whoever your Persian king is, we are so afraid of what they might say and what they might do that we have not realized that the hands of the king are in the hand, the heart of the king is in the hands of God. And God can turn that thing whichever way he wants to turn it. 
So here we are afraid to walk in the spaces. Here we are afraid to walk boldly like we know who our daddy is. Here we are afraid to speak up and to speak out. And, and the king's heart has already been turned. Yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get that later in your life. That the, the king's heart has already been turned in your favor. It, it, it keeps going on, and he says, then the king said, what are you requesting? And so Nehemiah says, I prayed to the God of heaven. And he said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, and then send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me. And he had given him, after I'd given him a time. And the king said, to, and he said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me as, I, as he approaches the governor. So he was saying here, look, here I am, and I'm scared because I've never walked in this place before. Here I am, and I know that, 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 that you don't walk in front of a king like this. And Nehemiah chose to do it. Nehemiah chose to boldly do it. And look what happened because the heart of the king was in the hands of God, and God was already working this thing. I remember he was positioned. God was already working this thing out. And remember who the, who the stepmother was. Who, remember all this influence that God had already tilled the ground, and God already knew that Nehemiah was going to come into the court that day. God already knew that Nehemiah was going to make the request. God already knew. God already knew. God already knew. And all Nehemiah had to do was walk in there and understand that God had him. And it's the same thing in your life today. God has you. God has you. Amen. God has you. And God wants you to exercise the courage to collaborate with him knowing that he has you. I know you may not have walked this way before. I know that, that the mountain may seem uh, un, 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 unconquerable. I know that, that your, your relationship might be in a difficult place. I know that raising those kids may be hard right now. I know, I know, I know, but I know that God has you. My grandfather used to tell me when I was growing up, he says, look, when you're going through difficulties in life, just get some sleep. I said, Pops, if things are difficult and I'm going through some stuff, shouldn't I be pacing the floor? Shouldn't I be worried? Shouldn't I be trying to write out the solutions and, and, and map out the plan and, and all this and all? He says, no. Get some sleep. And I said, Pops, what are you talking about? He says, Yes. Because if you believe that God has you, and he neither slumber nor sleeps, no point in both of y'all staying awake. Amen. So he says when life gets tough, when things get difficult, when you are in places that you've never been before, he says sometimes just go to sleep and know that God's got you. So you and I need to understand that we have emotions. We have pain. We have to take that emotions. We have to take that pain. We have to align it with God. We have to say, God, take my emotion. God, take my pain. Tell me what you want done with it. And when we take that emotion and we take that pain and we align it with God, God then says, okay, I, I, I need you to pray. I need you to fast. I need you to hear. I need you to hear from me. And then God says, I need you to Act with me. I need you to be courageous. I need you to, to know that I've got you. Nehemiah, at the end of this all, some of you who studied the text understand that in 52 days, they rebuilt the wall. They rebuilt the wall because he chose to not just be emotional about it. Worship team. He chose not to be just emotional about it. He chose to give it to God. And I'm saying to you today, you might be emotional. You might be in pain. Nothing is going to change in your life until you give that to God. Those tears that you're crying are not going to transform you until you give that thing to God. The tears that you're crying about your marriage, not, nothing's going to change until you give that to God. The tears that you are crying in your singleness, 
nothing's going to change until you give that to God. The tears that we're crying about our community, young people being killed, 17, 15, 12 years old, nothing is going to change until we take that emotion, we take that pain, and we give it to God. Turn to the person next to you say, hey, I know you might have emotions. I know you might be in pain right now. But give that to God and let God transform it. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the word today that says you want to take our tears and you want to transform us. You want to take those tears and you want to transform us. You want to change us. You want to get us off the hamster wheel. And you want to get us moving in the direction you would have us to go. So God, I pray that you've moved on someone's heart, someone's mind today who says, I'm tired of just crying. I'm tired of just feeling angry. I'm tired of feeling pain. I'm tired of being frustrated. I want to move in alignment with God. I want to act with God, and I want to see transformation in my life, in my home, and in my community. So today, God, we pray that you would draw with loving kindness. We pray today, God, that as, as people might come forth today for prayer at the altar today, that they would come, yes, with tears, yes, with pain, but more powerfully ready to be transformed by you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand? And if today you are here and you, you feel the call of God to say, look, I, I, I want to move beyond my tears. I want to be transformed. I want to be changed. I want my marriage to be changed. I want my relationship with my children to be changed. I, I, I want my community to be changed. I, I'm calling you forward today. Come forward today and, and pray and, and, and allow folks to, to minister with you and to stand with you today believing that those tears have purpose. Those tears are the catalyst that God wants to use to move you to be where he wants you to be, doing what he wants you to do. I know that God loves you. I know that God cares about you. And I know that today God wants to do a new thing in your life. I know that today that, that God wants you off the hamster wheel. God sees you tired. God sees you frustrated. God sees you weary. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burdens, they are light. He sees your tears. And he says, come on, bring them to me. He sees your hurt. He says, come on bring it to me. He sees your pain. He says, bring it to me. He sees that you are upset about situations. He says, bring it to me. Praise your name, God. Bring it to him today. Allow God to transform you.